So we're going to watch circuit breakers early. Again, uh, looking for a S&P decline of 208. That would trigger the first circuit breaker, and we would pause for about 15 minutes uh, as uh, the headlines over the weekend have come fast and furious. I want to bring a special person today to the table. I know you see me posting videos of um, tutorials, and you see I'm using the Tastyworks platform. Um, but today, I want to actually bring the mastermind, the innovator behind it, uh, to explain a little bit on the importance of using a platform. I want to bring the guy, the man, the innovator, Tom Sosnoff, to the table. He's actually the co-founder of Thinkorswim. Um, he went ahead and sold uh, Toss to TD Ameritrade. After that, he went on to co-found Tasty Trade and also the newly launched Tastyworks that I speak highly of in 2017. Um, Tom brings 20 plus years of experience as a market maker for the Chicago Board Options Exchange. And he's also one of the original OEX traders in the S&P 100 index pit. Um, he was also named in Tech Week's Tech 100 list. Uh, he's spoken at various uh, conferences. He's spoken to the University of Chicago TEDx, TD Ameritrade's Market Drive, and the He Said, She Said Tour for Tasty Trade. Um, and last but not least, he received the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2014. You know, we can go on uh, for days about Tom's accolades, uh, but I want to turn it over to Tom and just have him, you know, introduce himself a little further. And uh, Tom, in 2014, that was, that was actually a good year for the both of us. You know, I had my son that year and I was able to join my fraternity. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I don't even, all the years kind of, they, they blend together at this point, you know. <laughs> like, I have no idea if you'd ask me what year we won that uh, thing, but um, it was cool. And um, no, that's a very nice introduction. I appreciate it. Yeah. Has has this? Um, do you felt like? Do you feel like working from home has this made you more productive or a little bit less productive? It's made me less collaborative. It's okay. made me. It's made me less. Um, uh, um, I think it stifles your creativity a little bit. It stifles your, you know, a little bit of your um, imagination. I mean, I know you got plenty of time to think about things, but when you're not a surrounded by people and you're not bouncing things off off other people and you're not like you know just you know you know me i, I kind of like the locker room um I, I like working because i kind of like that's where all my friends are that's kind of right. a locker room effect you know yeah i know i know a lot of businesses man they, like you said they just had to adapt um i recently heard that the nfl they're gonna have to conduct the draft over a video conference I'm, that's oh yeah interesting yeah. to see like yeah, that's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. It's going to be horrible. Right. It's and already it's already what like a week long. Just imagine how long it's going to take now. Like it's going to be brutal. Everything, everything on, uh, you know, listen. The, the technology is great today. You know, Zoom, this this Google Meetup. You know, all everything. I've used Skype. I've used Facebook. You know, all of them. They're all good. But the bottom line is they they. Um, not the same thing. No matter what you do, yeah. It's not, yeah. We're, we're still filming from home right now. It's a, it's. I'm not. I'm not complaining, but it's just. It's different. It's. There's something missing. There's a piece missing to it. Right. But I mean, nonetheless, you know, like you said, you know, we're adapters, and you yeah, know, like, sure. like you always say, because you're a trader, you know, you have to make split second decisions. So yeah, I'm pretty sure you know that. In uh, you didn't skip a beat with any of that. Um, but hey, let's jump right in. You know, the purpose of this time, I really just wanted to bring you on uh, because I'm always, like I said, I'm always, you know, showing my followers uh, tutorials using the Tastyworks platform. Sure. Uh, and I thought it would have just been an amazing opportunity to hear it from, you know, from you yourself. Yeah. That's uh, because, cool. You know, there are things that I'm missing. Uh, but at the same time, it's one of those things where, you know, when we're doing it ourselves and we're taking control of our portfolio, um, it's important that we know what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so, Tom, just, you know, just after, you know, the introduction and whatnot, why, why did you choose the financial industry? Because when I got out of college, it was 1979. Okay. And in 1979, it was the middle of the um, interest rates were like 20 percent, 22 percent short term rates. There was it was the exact opposite now. Now rates are zero. Back then, rates were in the 20s. And it was just a hellish time. I mean, we were in the middle of a really ugly recession. There were no jobs. But, you know, when you graduate college, you don't realize that. Like, you're not thinking we're in recession because to you, that's all you know. So to me, it seemed normal. But, you know, interviews were hard to come by. The first really good interview I got was with a was with a financial firm in New York City called Drexel Burnham. And they offered me a job in their training program. And I was like, all right, man, you're in finance. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you did you study finance? Only as a minor, like my major was political science. I really thought that in some way, shape or form, I would be in some form of, you know, like I'd done all my internships in state legislature or international, 
you know, governments with them. And, and I'd never done anything in the world of business before. Wow. Um, so, but you know, listen, you're, when you're 22 years old, you can pretty much adopt to anything, right? Right. And it's not right. that hard. Absolutely. And it's funny you say that, that you were in the middle of a recession when you graduated college, because um, 07, 08, actually, I was a sophomore in college. Um, I studied finance and whatnot, and we were in the middle of the recession. And it was interesting. It was interesting just to see and learn, like, hey, these, this is more so the reason why things are happening. AIG was down to a dollar. Yeah. Um, and yeah. if I if I was, you know, hip to everything that I'm hip to now, I mean, I'd probably probably be a millionaire. But, you know, you know, college, <laughs> you know, college kids, we get our refund checks and we just go splurging, you know, shopping. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> oh, we were the same way, except we didn't have any refunds back then. <laughs> <laughs> now, you said uh, Drexel Burnham, right? Yeah. How, how long were you with the firm before? I was with the firm for about nine months before um, I met these guys that were working there. And uh, they they um, it was funny. They were older than me and they really wanted to trade. They weren't interested in like whatever jobs they had. And they really wanted to manage like money, okay. but they need, but they, they thought they understood options. And at the time I didn't know anything. So I thought they were geniuses, but so they said, I mean, I was 22 and single or 23, you know, whatever, turning 23. And they said, listen, here's the deal. If you move to Chicago and you go to the floor of the option exchange, um, cause you don't want to be stuck here at this firm, you know, like, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be stuck here. I want to go, I want to go to the trading floor, you know? And, um, and it looks so cool and screaming and yelling and everybody, they go, you move out there to Chicago. And I didn't know one freaking soul out here. I go, they, they said, we'll put up 50 grand. And I thought 50 grand was like a hundred million at the time. <laughs> I swear. I thought 50 grand. I literally thought it was a hundred million. And, and so, you know, I had like 1500 bucks to my name okay. and, or whatever. And I'd been trading a lot of options at Drexel as a, you know, with my first job, I just fell in love with it. So like, I was like, I'm ready. Right. And when I got to Chicago um, with the 50 grand and, you know, and everything else that those guys blew out in 30 days, lost all their money. All, all, all naked positions. No, I don't even know what they had on because they, <laughs> they, 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 like I was supposed to fill their orders, but I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Right. So right. they just brokers, you know, and I was just there trying to learn. And um, I had only made uh, three trades. I was up $18 and 75 cents at the time total in my first month. And <laughs> I mean, literally up eighteen dollars. So after expenses, I was down. But um, uh, but they blew out, and so I was in Chicago. I had no job, and I didn't know a single person here. Okay. And I was like, oh man, I'm fucked. But um, <laughs> but eventually, I you know, I I just hung around and met some people, and some guy gave me a hundred grand to trade with, and I had to give him like thirty percent of the profits. So I was like done, and I I figured out how to do this business and. Within within two years, I bought him out, you know, and started to make my own money, and I didn't need him anymore, and I was just, you know, kept 100% of what I made, and so I was just a market maker for the next, you know, 20 years. Okay. Now, now, typically, market makers, you know, as you being on the floor, it doesn't mean you're just really just raising your own money and trading securities there. Yeah, you just well, we well, there's lots of different kinds of market makers, but at the time, it was mostly independent guys like me, prop traders, and um, there was only two kinds of traders. There was only brokers floor brokers and then there was independent traders the floor brokers filled orders and the independent traders traded for themselves i was an independent trader you know tried to make markets tried to get you know stick my face in there and get you know a piece of the order flow um and everybody was really good there wasn't any like bad traders right. so you know you had to figure it out only like five percent of the people survive and hey, listen i i made it it lasted 20 years i mean you know and it was a good run and the only reason i left was to build thinkorswim and that, that's actually one of my questions. But kind of just going back to, you know, you just being a prop trader, like a market maker. Um, I know with us, you know, usually traders on the outside, like retail traders, you, you know, the amateur traders, we're chasing price. Now, with yeah, market yeah, makers, yeah. Are, you, are you mainly chasing like that bid-ass spread, you know, like, you know, making more? Well, in, in a perfect world, yeah, you're buying on the bid and selling on the offer. Okay. But there really is no such thing as a perfect world. Right. So a lot of times you're buying the offers and selling the bids, you know. Right. We're doing what we did now. We just had a little more of an edge because – Every once in a while, there'd be a juicy order, you know, and uh, the customers would kind of get picked off. But um, those days are all electronic now. They don't exist anymore. But right. back then it was all open outcry. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I was learning, learning on the go. And it took me, you know, it took me, um, I think I started in 1981. And by like 1985, you know, I made, you know, by 1984, 1985, I had made my first million or something, you know, whatever it was. 
So I was like, this is, you know, this is where I got to be. <laughs> hey, because, you know, they say your first million is hard. So once you hit that, I mean, I, I guess you were good. They say huh? your first billion is hard now, just so you know. <laughs> oh, excuse yeah. me. Well, in my yeah. world, we still, we still on millions. So, <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm just saying, like, I was making all this money. We, we were like, we were like, like, think of it like young athletes today making way too much money. You know, yeah. that's what we were. You know, I, I always tell the story. Um, we were sitting at a Bulls game one night. We had seats on the on the floor. It was 1985 and uh, 1985 or 1986. I think it was 1985. And Jordan leaned over to us and he said, someday I want to make as much money as you guys. Mm. And, and we looked at each other. We go, you are going to. Right. <laughs> so we go. Don't you worry, Michael. You're going to get there. And, I mean, he uh, he, so even though he's where he is now, he probably still hasn't touched where y'all are. But I mean, hey, it's, it's, it's his dreams, I guess. Well, at the time he was like 20, you know, he's a couple years younger than me. So we were, I was probably 20, let's see, I was probably 28 and he was probably 24 or something. Wow. It's, fu it's funny you say that because I look, I look at you, Tony and, and, and Scott, and like you said, you know, you, you guys just made a ton of money growing up and it's just like, how did you all stay level-headed? How did y'all stay disciplined? Here, here's the deal. You didn't, you think you make a ton of money, right? Because okay. it's the same as athletes. Like back then in the 80s, you know, like I couldn't even tell my parents how much money we were making because because like they were killing themselves, working their butts off with, you know, with law degrees and master's degrees, and everything else, you know, and I'm making, you know, 20 or 50 times what they're making and <laughs> fooling around, you know, and I'm like, right, I'm not telling right. them anything, you know, right. I'll tell you a story. I, I took my dad. My dad was a civil rights attorney and um you know, he 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 lived he lived in Mississippi for a couple of years, giving out free um, legal advice. You know, he he was basically a First Amendment civil rights attorney. Okay. And I took my dad once to a Bulls game in 1986, and he came out, and I'll never forget the seats were seventy five dollars. And the last was time my dad were courtside? Went, yeah, they were courtside. Oh. They were seventy five bucks and set it on the ticket. That was the lowest price they ever were, by the way. <laughs> That's when they first came out of them. The last time my dad went to an NBA game. He sat in the upper deck at Madison Square Garden and he paid either 25 or 50 cents. He couldn't remember. So he'd never had a ticket where he paid more than a dollar for in his life to baseball, basketball, or football. Okay? Right. And he was an usher at Yankee Stadium when he was a kid growing up. So he'd never paid more than a dollar. He looked at the tickets. He goes, I'm not going to the game. I go, why are you not going to the game? He goes, 75 hours a ticket. I'm not going to the game. And I go, Dad, I, I, I looked at him. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, Dad, that's for the whole season. And he goes, "Okay, no, it's not." <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm telling you. Even so, though, even, even though it probably wasn't, it was just, it was just a tactic to get him there. Oh yeah, yeah, it was just to get him there because uh -huh. he was like he was balking. He didn't want to go to the game, but but you know we were just young stupid kids. But then we also you lead a lifestyle where you know to be fair, when you're making a lot of money when you're young, just like professional athletes do now, you know you blow it all. We used to say you make a million dollars, you lose a million dollars, you're down a million dollars. Like, you don't have to, you know, you, you just, you, it all goes, like, like it all goes. It's just I, a I stupid lifestyle. I can't, I can't wait to experience that. You know, hopefully, hopefully I won't be able to blow it, though. <laughs> but when you won't because, because you're smarter and you're older. We were young and stupid. That's why, like, when I see these athletes and these, these kids, you know, they get, like, you know, some basketball player, football player, they'll get, like, you know, $30 million and they'll go, and they'll go, now we're broke. I'm like, I completely <laughs> understand. Like, right, right. I completely get it. That's I saw more people, you know, over the years, even though it was a fun business over the years, there's only about five or six percent of the people make it. Yeah. So it was really a small percentage. It wasn't like, you know, we talk about it like it was easy. It, it, you know, like what some of us ended up doing, there was only a couple of us that did it. You know, right. it wasn't. Like and I, I mean, and that makes sense because I always hear, you know, you know, they say day traders, they say options traders, you know, about 80, 85. Sometimes there's a big difference between day traders and prop traders. Right. Okay. Day traders. Day traders. We, we made our living off of day traders. Got you. Got you. And, yeah. and, and it's funny because that's what I was going to say. You know, they, you know how they say like 80, 80 percent, uh, you know, loses. But on the flip side, that means 20 percent is winning 80 percent of the time. So it's like, hey, if I'm getting this money from these, these day traders that are losing, somebody on the other end is winning. So I guess you were you were the guys on the other end that were winning. Yeah. The other end, it was a small group that won. But yeah. Yeah. We. After a while, it just becomes kind of second nature and you okay. learn what to do. Right. And so, I, listen, I have no regrets. I loved my I loved my 19 or 20 years on the trading floor. But, you know, it gets to be a grind and it gets to be hard. And, 
you know, there's some pretty wild swings and, and you live close, you live pretty close to the edge, you know, like it's not, you know, you're, you're feeding yourself. Nobody else is, nobody else is buying you one thing, so, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And then at, after we saw the markets going electronic, we decided, you know, 19 or 20 years is a long time to be standing in one spot. It's time mm -hmm. to try something different. Right. And that's when we went out and built Thinkorswim. Okay. Now, now, at what point, because I know, you, you know you're big, you take the contrarian stance. At what point in that career did you decide that, hey, this actually works best for me? You mean the contrarian stance? Yeah. Um, I, I felt like that as a, when, you're a, when you're a market maker, you have no choice. If somebody wants to buy something, you sell it to them. Yeah. Yeah. You're like a bookie in a sense. You know, like the bookie doesn't, you don't get to make your bet. You just take whatever the other person wants to do. And, and obviously, because, I mean, that's your job. You have to make sure there's a buyer for every seller, a seller for every buyer. Well, we were, we were the buyer for every seller, and we were the seller for every buyer. Okay. I mean, that's, that was our job, basically. Just, you know, adjust the price to wherever you wanted to sell it or adjust the price to wherever you wanted to buy it, and then that's the market. Okay. And how long would you – I mean, obviously, you wouldn't want to hold it for long. What was your, like, ideal time to get rid of it? Is like, right away like, or – Like, about three seconds <laughs> in a perfect world. <laughs> okay, okay. But, but you know, sometimes you have to hold it for days or weeks or months. But, right. you know, sometimes you can get out of something in, you know, literally in a second. That's very interesting because, you know, as a retail trader, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, I can, I can sit on it for a couple of days. But I know as that market maker, it's like, man, that clock is ticking. As a market maker, if, if I bought something at a dollar and then you were standing next to me and you said you were a dollar ten bid, it's I was selling it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I was taking like that, that ten cents and running. Yep. Right. Now, of course, like, you know, you did touch on, um, you know, just going into the technology phase. Now, when you were building Thinkorswim. You know, and I know you talk about plenty of times where, you know, you kind of lost control of the company. So you kind of had no um, say so over it being sold to TD Ameritrade. Um, um, we had a, I was the largest. Scott and I were the largest two shareholders. OK, so we did have some say, but we didn't have enough to control the board. We didn't have a majority anymore. So we were a public company. Um, so and the problem was that we had three companies bidding for us, not TD, just TD Ameritrade. There's two others, too. Okay. So there were three companies simultaneously bidding for us. So we had no choice. Um, in hindsight, I'm glad that happened the way it happened. Like, like I really regretted selling TD to, I'm selling Microsoft to TD because that was my sweat equity. I love that company and I wanted to see what happens. But you know, in life, um, I'm, I'm not religious. I don't, I'm not like one of these, you know, I don't, I don't believe in like everything happens for a reason or fate or things like that. But, but I do think that sometimes the marketplace forces you to do something different. I, I don't know if you've ever heard like, um, uh, you know, Theo Epstein talk about it, but um, he talks about like every 10 years, you kind of need to do something a little different, you know, or every, every so often you need to do something a little different because, because otherwise life gets boring. So we got an opportunity to build tasty trade and I have no regrets. Now, when you built Tasty Trade, you know, after, you know, Toss went to CD and Meritrade, what, what type of trader did you have in mind when you were building a Tastyworks platform? Well, when we built Thinkorswim, going back just a little bit, our focus at the time was to build really cool technology that didn't mm -hmm. exist. And we thought, like, we were, you know, we were very confident, you know, probably way too egotistical, everything else. So we thought we knew everything about trading. You know, I mean, we're just like, Hey, we know everything there is to know, and and we can build this technology, and we can, you know trade on the floor. We know everything, but we what we realized when we built Thinkorswim was that okay, we can build cool technology now, but we really don't know anything. Like when it comes to you know, like it was a rude awakening that how little we really knew about trading as a retail customer and markets and things like that, and just the whole complexity and all the depth of the retail space. So when we sold Thinkorswim, one of the first things we thought about was, you know, there's no good content in the world mm -hmm. for trading. Like, like there's financial media, but it sucks. And it's all news related and it's all guests and it doesn't make any sense to us because there's no real takeaway from it. Who cares what somebody else's opinion are? Is I already know their opinion doesn't mean anything. I only care, like give me some facts. I want I want some meat. I want I want real quantitative research that will tell me, you know, give me some step-by-step -step mechanics. And that's what we did. And that's what we eventually came to, you know, build 
tasty around was was the idea that there were optimal mechanics out there that nobody had ever studied before, yeah. and we were going to be the first to do that. Okay, and that that makes sense because when I stopped by um, the Tasty Trade headquarters, you you were actually at the Orlando Money Show. This is about two years ago. I was expecting to walk in. I see CNBC. I'm thinking I'm going to see Fox Business News. There's not even we don't even have cable. Any, yeah, so that so that makes sense by you explaining that. Yeah, we have a rule, which is basically you know I don't care what the competition does, no matter what. There's no, nobody in our office is going to turn on cable TV. Okay. You know, like, cause I don't, you're not watching Bloomberg. You're not watching CNBC. Those guys watch us all the time and they steal ideas from us. We refuse to watch. I don't want any of their ideas. Right. You know, I, I, I'm original. I want to be, I want everything to be original. Absolutely. And, and I mean, honestly, uh, Tom, kudos to you and your research team. Um, cause I'm learning something new every day, even just from 10, 15 minute segments. And it helps yeah. me digest it a lot better because it's, you know, condensed into 10 to 15 minutes. Um, yeah. And like you said, it, it just comes from in-house. And I've learned a lot just from following the Tasty Trade way, looking at the research team. Then I did because I studied finance. You know, we learned options, but it wasn't. Like Where'd you go to school? I went to Norfolk State University in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk State. Okay. Uh -huh. Got it. Yep. And, um, you know, just just, you know, buy your calls, buy in the money calls, you know, sell out of the money puts. Yeah, even sure. Basic things, taking naked positions. When, you know, if you really learn a tasty trade way, you understand like, hey, I'm actually taking more risk by taking a naked position. Our objective is to like, we know that that I can't do stuff that's going to make anybody money. Like I can't I can't create a curriculum. I can't create research that I know you can take or anybody else can take and just turn it into, you know, printing money. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can empower you with a set of mechanics. We can empower you with ideas, with challenges, uh -huh. with knowledge, with foundation, with know-how. And and then it, and then all of a sudden, someone like you, you go, hey, this is on me. Because right. you always want it on you anyway. Absolutely. You don't want somebody. Like, like successful people don't want other people to do stuff. You want to do it yourself. Because once you turn it over to somebody else, you you lose that control. You lose that. Yeah, power. I mean, I mean, we're in a world right now where people are understanding how dangerous it is to be really to be passive, and mm -hmm. what you want is control over your own, you know, your own optics, your own mechanics, your own, you know, all your own decision making. The, the most valuable thing you can do, especially at your age, especially you know, like like where you are at, at the stage in your life, you are where you're you you haven't even. Like, like we didn't build Ingersoll until I was, I think, 42. I didn't build Tasty until we were, you know, 50 something, 53 okay. something, 52. So there's no, like you're in your, you're not even in your prime yet. And most successful, really successful entrepreneurs, late 30s, early 40s, that kind of stuff. Because it's not that you're that, it's not that you're that much smarter. It's just that you have better decision-making skills. You have a much better foundation mm -hmm. of what it takes. Like, we backed a couple of businesses with really young entrepreneurs, 22, 25, you know, whatever, 27. And most of the time, the smarter they are and no matter how I'm sorry, no matter how smart they are, they're generally not successful or they can't think big because they just, you know, they just don't have that decision making experience, that okay. risk, that appetite for risk. Like a guy like Zuckerberg making it at whatever, 22, 23. Yeah. is really freaking rare and <laughs> what's more likely is you're going to find some some 40 year old or some 50 year old entrepreneur like 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 i was and you're going to find after all those experiences i spent 20 years grinding it out right, right you know and and you learn a lot about yourself about decision making about everything else and then that changes you know who you are that's that's a good point. Um, I, and it gives me a little bit more reassurance because it's one of those things where, you know, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s. It's like, man, I'm supposed to be sitting on 500 million now. Like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I feel empty. Oh, you, you, you need to be sitting on 500,000 decisions. And if that's the case, you know, like you got to realize, you know, not everybody's an outlier. You can't take some you can't take some like, you know, some actor, some singer, some some NBA basketball player and look and look at a young kid as an outlier that's making 100, 200 million. If you look at the entrepreneur world, there's very few 22 or 24 year old entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that have reached that level. 
But they're but when you look at the companies that are really successful and you look at the people that have created value, they're a little bit older, they have some experience, they have a much better networking system built, so they can raise capital, so they can they can, you know, they can think through their ideas, that kind of stuff. And and, and it's funny you touch on decision making. Um, you know, one thing I did notice about the Tastyworks platform, it didn't have a, a paper trading option. You know, obviously yeah, when it comes yeah. to decision making and whatnot, yeah, I, I know yeah. for me, what worked for me was I started, you know, paper trading, even though yeah. there's no emotion attached and whatnot, but that helped yeah. me make better decisions. Yeah. What was one of the and reasons you didn't incorporate that into the Tastyworks platform? So the diff it's not that we didn't want to. When we built TOTS back then and we built like the first really good paper trading platform, the revenue was four times what it is today, like commission revenue was four times higher and we provided virtually no content. And so in starting when we built Tastyworks, the models changed. The revenue is about 25% of what it was before on a trade. Like we used to make like, let's say 10, $12 on a trade. Now we make $2 and 50 cents average, you know? Okay. So, so our revenue is significantly less and we spend tens of millions of dollars creating um, content that we never did before. So we don't have the resources available to, that we had before. Like we, instead of having 250 developers, you know, we have 70, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. So it's just a function in 2020 of how you spend your resources because the technology today is so much better and mm -hmm. it's so much more stable, but you have to spend your money differently. I don't want to give up our content for a paper trading platform. Um, I remember just trying to, after I started paper trading with, with Sauce, so I applied to get approved the trade options and he actually denied me. And and it's one of those things where I was like, well, like, what's going on? And I remember when I came across Tasty Trade and I was looking at the commissions and I'm, you know, me just being used to Scott Trade, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, $6.95. I sold a $1 per contract. I'm like, no, I'm paying $6.95 and 75 cents per contract. Why would I pay $1? Right. But I literally came across a taste like the Tasty Trade uh, fees and commission structure. It probably was like two, three in the morning. You know, I wasn't really like fully awake. So I didn't notice that there was no closing commissions. There was literally just that one dollar per trade. So I put that off to the side. And when I got that denial from TD Ameritrade, they wanted me to go through um, at the time. I think they had like Investals or whatever um, yeah. educational platform they had. They were like, hey, you know, if you go through this, we can prove it probably later and whatnot. And, you know, just as time went on. I revisited, you know, the website and I was like, whoa, wait, the whole time is just one dollar per contract, no closing commissions. And it reminded me of the Amazon effect. I'm like, how, how isn't anybody onto this? Like you had the lowest commissions across the industry for you. Yeah, really hard to build a brokerage firm because you're competing against firms that spend, you know, TD spends 250 million a year in advertising. Schwab spends right. 300 million a year. You know, and here we are building a new firm with our own content right. and everything trying to be different. But you don't have, you know, you can't spend, you know, you can't spend any money on on traditional marketing. So getting the word out there is really difficult. But, you know, we're a little better at it than most people. That's why there's not a lot of boutique firms like us. But but still, it's a challenge, man. We, we go up against all the big guys and, you know, all they all want to do is squash us. So, but I mean, there's also there's also a blessing in the way your firm is being ran, because, Tom, I mean, I'll say um, the reason you are very successful is because you, you, you're you shaking hands with your customers. You're yes, answering emails. You're, answering, you're answering phone calls. I mean, who? I mean, think about it. If, if, if I go trade with Toss, I can't call up the CEO and be like, hey, I have this position on. You couldn't even tell me who the CEO is. You would have no <laughs> idea. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, you're, you're going to these shows. You're, you're hosting these free events where you're allowing your customer to come talk. Talk to the traders. Ask yeah, questions. Yeah, we, we do it. It's part of our culture. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in the future now with all the crazy stuff going on. But you know, for, with with live events. But but you know, clearly, you know, we're going to do everything we can. And and our culture is not going to change at all. And we're going to be there to support everybody. You know, that's that's the way we operate. Absolutely. Now, what, what would you say? Because I know you said it's challenging. What would you say is your biggest challenge when it comes to um, managing a firm of this size? Um. It's it's not managing the firm that's the challenge. It's it's keep the, the biggest challenge is keeping everybody challenged. In other words, like I hate complacency, and I like to keep everybody at the firm on their toes. Yeah. Like if any, it, like I don't want anybody that's just going through the motions. So I have to keep people challenged, and that is really hard to do. It's hard to challenge your developers. 
It's hard to challenge your research team. You know, it's hard. To, people get, you know, people get bored. They get complacent. They get, you know, they, things get too easy for them. So we're always trying to challenge people, and that is the biggest challenge. And of course, you know, outside of Tasty Works, you know, I did notice obviously the small exchange, and you have Doe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I recently, I recently downloaded Doe a couple of weeks ago, and I was it's actually a good impressed. Platform. I was actually yeah, it's a beautiful platform. Yeah. yeah Vic, Victor Jones came to work for me at TD, and he was one of their rising stars. And so I brought him over to um, to run Doe because I think it, I needed a younger voice and a different voice. I mean, Victor's been in the business for ten years. He's only he's thirty two or thirty. 30 yeah, he's, he's about my age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how old are you? I'm thirty one. Uh, he's thirty three, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but um, you know, grew up, you know, single mom, you know, you know, I mean, just typical, typical story, just a hustle, like a kid that was hustling his butt off, you know. Went to work at TD when he was in his early 20s and, and you know, super ridiculously smart and and um, super confident. And, you know, he deserves a shot. He has the potential to be a superstar. And, and I wanted to go in somebody else's vision. You know, I didn't want a 60-year-old guy creating vision, for, you know, for, for millennials. I wanted, yeah. I wanted, you know, somebody that was in their space and that can speak the language and also that... You know, they knew some of the struggles, you know, yeah. and so um, it's a really beautiful platform. I mean, we're it's obviously designed to compete with Robinhood. Okay. And, so, um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens when they launch, you know, options and small exchange futures and everything else. Um, you know, listen, like I said, I think Victor has the potential to be a superstar, whether or not he's able to perform at that level. You know, well, that remains to be seen. But that's everybody has that challenge. You know, Absolutely. all you can hope for in life is to get that challenge, to get yeah. that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, is there are there any plans to um, integrate or incorporate Tastyworks in a dough, or are you just going to no. keep it completely separate? No, it's a completely separate. Um, it's a completely separate broker dealer. I mean, we own it a hundred percent. Okay. So it's it's in our it's in our family of products, but it's it's completely um, it's built on the backbone of our technology. So it's it's so much better. The technology is so much better than like Robinhood or other competitors. It's actually got great infrastructure it's on high frequency technology it's amazing but you know they have the challenge of going out and getting you know small accounts and and it's it's a very competitive space yeah now let's say let's say for instance somebody like me let's say if i were to go back and i started with dough and then i made that transition and i wanted to start trading options yeah, you could do that too sure. oh so, so you can do that on the dough platform um you will be able to trade options we're about to launch them but it's it's a different world like if you wanted to buy or sell an option, you know, yeah. or do a simple spread, you could do it on dough. But if you wanted the content and all the functionality that Tasty has, mm -hmm. you can't do that stuff on dough. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's a little bit more like the advanced trader and all the trader. Yeah. Somebody like you will never, can never go backwards to dough. I mean, not that okay. dough is like a step backwards. It's just, it's for somebody just starting out, you know, you know, you want free commissions, you want, you know, you just want to get your feet wet, that kind of thing. But it just, it doesn't have the depth. You know, it's very slick platform. It's got great content. It we produced it all in house. It's a completely separate company, but it's it's for a different it's for a different um, demographic. Would you say it's really more so for just a passive investor who's never going to take that step? No, to no, I don't think so. Okay, but it's for somebody that like it's that is just maybe just starting out that doesn't want to take that act of a role, you know, gotcha. like, like it could be for someone like you're considered like an elder, LD, elderly millennial. I think <laughs> you're at the top end of the millennial range. Like what is it? 35 or something? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. But, but you fit into either group we have. Okay. But, but with your experience and all the trading you've done, you, you, you have to use a, 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 a more advanced piece of software. You do. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and one thing I do like about Tastyworks and it's funny because I always, um, you know, when I was going through my, my time at school and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to set up, I'm going to have this big setup. I'm going to have all my monitors set up. And it wasn't until I came across the Tastyworks platform. I was like, I really only need one monitor. I don't need to keep switching back and forth oh, yeah. to different screens. Yeah. And that's one thing I definitely, one of many things that I definitely loved about the platform. Like yeah, that we did it right specifically there. for that reason. I mean, okay. Woody and Woody and his designers built Tastyworks specifically for a single screen because we think it's a joke. I saw this guy on some guy on a YouTube video that did like 75 monitors. I'm like, that's such a, <laughs> it's such a it's such a gimmick, like to try to get people to subscribe or whatever. I mean, yeah. literally, you need one monitor. Right. Sometimes people use it as like a, an opportunity where it's like, look how smart I am. 
Just because I'm I using all of these monitors, like. Yeah, I know. I've done it myself. I mean, I've built some crazy stuff with, you know, I built something once with 250 monitors just to fool around, you know, for for a display. We've done I've done absolutely crazy stuff like that before, um, and I love it. It's just it's not my, um, you know, I've reached a different point in my life now. I, I want to do things that are that are crazy efficient. You've touched on three different important aspects of traders. You have Tasty Works, obviously, for you know experienced options traders if they want to trade options on futures. You have Doe for like the millennials, and then you also have the small exchange coming up. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? The small exchange is actually really exciting. We just got um, we just got a regulatory approval, and we are um, hope hopefully our go date is May 18th. So you know we're going to launch a new futures exchange, the first one in almost three or four decades in the U.S., and it's going to have very small um, contracts that are similar to the 100 shares of like a 50 or $60 ETF. So like you could do a future, it moves, like today I'll show you, I have this quotes up here. Like our stock future moved $33 today. Our, um, uh, our bond future moved $40 today. So things, you know, our gold future moved $200 today. So, so they don't move that much, generally speaking. It, you know, you can buy or sell a future, so they're very capital efficient. And the reality is you're basically only going to use like um, you're only going to use, uh, let's call it. I'm oh, sorry. I lost this here. You're only going to lose use like maybe um, 250 bucks in capital. So it's it's really a stock, a capital efficient stock replacement. Because I know you, you're big on pro being product and different. Is that a reason yeah. you've gotten into futures? The reason I did this. And it's kind of a long story, but for the last, um, I want to say the last almost 20 years, almost since the early 2000s, um, I thought the futures exchanges were didn't care about retail customers. So all their products were way too big until, and I've been preaching to them, trying to get them to have a small future for 15 years, and they never listened to me. And then, and they, they would listen, but they'd blow me off. And then finally, when we announced we we're launching the small exchange, they came out with a micro product, and it was a huge success. I'm telling you, man, that's the Amazon effect you have. You know, and Amazon is undercutting prices. And it's really funny because they they absolutely laughed at me, and um, and and then they went out and did it and said, "Oh, look how great this is! Look how smart we are!" And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, you fuckers, you stole that from me, you know? <laughs> um, but that's the truth. And he, here's the crazy thing about it. Even though they did that, they don't know all the stuff that I wanted to do. And so I feel really good about um, what we're about to launch with the small exchange. Mm -hmm. And and I also feel like, you know, we understand the customers better than they do. So I'm um, look, I'm hoping it works. I mean, we're going to go, we're gonna go all out and try to make it work. You know, over the years, when you when you're a brokerage firm and you have and you offer futures, the problem, Ty, is that when you do that, you you pay all the you take all the risk. You pay all the marketing costs, you pay for the data, you build all the technology, and then basically they charge these huge fees that are the huge exchange fees that are the equivalent of what you make in commissions. So we take five times the risk and pay them the same amount of money on like a rev share. And it's stupid. So I'm like, screw them. I'm going to create our own product. I remember one time I thought about taking the route with putting my LLC is I noticed there were all of these fees where we getting charged for like real time. Yeah, you, you can't, you can't do it because the, the exchanges, not, not the small exchange. We will not do that. Okay. But all the other exchanges consider a LLC or any kind of a corporate account to be professional okay. just so they can, just so they can steal additional fees from you. Okay. We're not doing that. We're treating everybody the same. Gotcha. And, I, and I'm glad me and my son came to the, the, the that event, you know, cause I was able to get my free subscription. So I definitely can't wait for that. Come on, your uh, your poli sci, it, you know, your your lobbying didn't come to play. You couldn't get it uh, approved earlier. Um, get, your, get your house of cards going. We worked our butts off, and actually, when I was in college, I interned for a lobbyist, and uh -huh. <laughs> and I learned a lot of lessons from that guy. He was quite the grifter. Uh, no, no, it didn't didn't help. <laughs> and Tom, real quick, so you know, obviously, you know, you you you've you've been in the game. You've seen many recessions. Um, you know, just going back to 08, 07 and 08, um, I recently saw um, a segment that the research, you and the research team put out where you were comparing the volatility 
uh, to this, you know, like today's recession or the movement in the, the market to 07 and 08, um, would you say this volatility or the movement in this market here, was this something new to you or is this yeah. one of those things? Okay. Yeah, I think that this was a pretty extraordinary move on every level. And it's hard for me to put to put it, to box it in with some of the other moves that we've seen. Okay. Um, this was this was as violent a this was as violent a move as I think I've ever seen next okay. to the 1987 crash. I know for me, my uh, my first violent move, if you want to put it that way, my first violent move was the trade war. This was last February. I was in a broken yeah. wing, I was in a broken wing butterfly at Boeing, and this is my first time ever getting a sign. I look in the account and it says basically I've been assigned 100 shares of Boeing and it was like negative 32,000. I'm like, what is going yeah. on? But the good thing with the broken wing butterfly, obviously, you know, you were, you were hedged. You were, it was defined risk. risk. And in, when I looked the next morning, you know, I'm sweating. I'm like, all right, let me just see what this account looks like. And then everything evened out. So I was like, okay, cool. And then it wasn't until this recession here, uh, me and my business partner, uh, my lady Tiff, um, she, you know, she invests heavily in the account and I just, you know, take control of it. And it was one of those things I was trying to explain to her. I was like, what's a lesson learned? You get what I'm saying? So this was, this was a lesson learned mm -hmm. for everybody, myself included. You know, this was a lesson learned to stay small. And, and, and that's another thing that you did bring to my attention is just, you know, staying small, um, yeah. trading small, trading often. Because uh, the first time around, the first first few times around where I blew up on my account, man, I was I was taking literally just my my capital and just going into one company like oh yeah, yeah. Gonna we, we all here. we all did that the first uh -huh. time around like right. you you're not alone every one of us did that what what, what does tasty works look like five years from now that's a great question um <laughs> bless you um but you must got the claps <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's really interesting because i'm not a person that i i don't really um, like I'm never a person with an end game. Like okay. people always say to me, like, you know, like, what are you going to do with this company? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know, <laughs> like, like this is my last gig. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not, you know, I, and I don't ever want to retire. So, yeah. you know, like, like you never know, like I'm going to build the most incredible company. This company is going to, it's going to, it's going to be an incredible company. And if somebody comes along, you know, and, and wants to pay a premium for it, then that's always a negotiation. But the reality is we're not looking, okay. you know, like, like we're happy doing what we do. You know, um, a lot of my, my daughter works there. Tony's um, son and daughter work there, nice. you know, like, like, like we don't care if we go on forever, you know, yeah. it's, it's, but you never know like what happens markets move and, you know, lots of things. Um, the world's like, very, everything's very unpredictable. There's no way you can know what you're going to do you know, where you're going to be a year from now or two years from now, or that kind of stuff. I mean, my goal is just build cool stuff. Absolutely. Just keep building cool stuff. Absolutely. It's worked for me my whole career. So yeah. I'm just going to yeah. keep doing it. And definitely kudos to you, man. And, and I enjoy all the events that I come to. You know, I've met you numerous times in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I, You know, I'm coming out the learning, man. So I'll see you there. No, you won't. Oh, you can't. So it's postponed? We're going to postpone it. We have no choice because it's... We announced it today and we're going to send a letter out. But unfortunately, we have no way to distance people at those at that event. Gotcha. It's it's a it's one theater. It's beautiful. If you if I told you, man, what we did into the, what we did for this, you know, bands and food and yeah, yeah. speakers, I'm flying in from all over and people are flying in from all over. And the problem is that in order to get enough people in this one, it's a beautiful old theater. But everything is pushed together. Okay. But there's no social. There's no distance. Like <laughs> I don't think the world's ready to be, you know, sitting side by side by side by side the first week of July. I right. mean, plus I, I just feel bad. I don't want people to lose their, you know, airplane month. They're like we're gonna we're gonna do it. We're def. I'm not doing it virtual. I'm doing it live. We're just gonna push it back till like towards the end of the year or early next year. Okay. But I'm, we're doing it for sure. It's just gonna have to be at a different time. And also, too, something um, that I meant to tell you, and I, I didn't tell you this. Remember the cherry that you gave me? Yeah. You know I lost it at my homecoming? Send me an email. I'll send you one. All right. I was at my tailgate, and, you know, I'm embracing everybody I haven't seen in a while. You know, I'm excited. So I get home, you know, I'm taking off. No more time. handshakes, no more embraces, just so yeah. you know. No glove, no love, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, I'll definitely shoot you my email. Send me two if you can. I'll send you as many as you want. Oh, hey, look, that's what we're talking. Include a check there too, okay? <laughs> no, <laughs> no problem. But Tom, I definitely appreciate this, man. And also, like I said, I'm gonna um, release this to my YouTube channel. You know, yeah, sure. Is- well, listen, we it- love it, man. We love it. Absolutely, because it works for me. And I don't know what works for me works for a lot of people that I know. What's a, a book that you will put out for an amateur uh, that wants to get into options trading? A book. Um, what about so the one I started reading? Um, and I don't know if that w- that's good for amateurs. Uh, Options and volatility, I think it was pricing by Shelley Natenberg. That's too hard. Too, okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Shelley spoke at our Geeks on Parade last year. Yeah. So Shelley spoke there. He's great. He's really knowledgeable. That's one of the Bibles of trading, but that's too hard for a person just, you know, looking to get in, in looking to get involved. It's just too heavy. You know, it's you can you can do it, but but not a person looking for the first time. It's just it'll turn you off. You know, it's that's just it. it's just too heavy. I think, you know, I like I'm not crazy about a lot of the more a lot of the newer books on trading i think to get people excited about finance it's more fun reading books about you know like that are more stories okay you know so like one of the books that i always tell people to to look at is but potentially like um when genius fails when When genius Genius failed okay which is which is a great book about the um the crash of long-term capital management okay you know, three Nobel Prize winners, basically not understanding that size kills. Size kills, and and I remember um, coming across a uh, video of yours. You were talking about wealth concentration. Uh, you talk I always talk about wealth concentration, yeah. and and you know that's a, another huge problem. And you're seeing part of the issues that we just had with this market selling off was, you know, there's there was way too much concentration in certain names. And way think, too much wealth concentration. Do you think that's going to continue to grow during these times here? Um, if we rally back up, I do because the strong stock stayed strong. Yeah. But you know, I think eventually you're going to see a disruption in 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 wealth. Yeah. And I remember you saying that too because you know you went back like ten years. You were like the market yeah. disruptors. They're not market disruptors now. That's right. Uh, I believe that. I believe when you look at Amazon and Apple and and, and stocks like that and Microsoft, they're going to have a hard time being the stocks that you're going to be trading in, you know, that you're going to be trading in 2030. Tom, so one 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 quick and last, uh, I guess, comparison. Um, he's actually one of my, I have many favorite CEOs, but you actually remind me of one of my favorite CEOs. And it's a wild guess. Do you think who I would say? I don't want to get myself in trouble. No, because no, I don't know. Who? Mark Cuban. And the, and the reason the reason I say Mark Cuban is because he was just like how you were an innovator and you moved the needle in the finance industry. I felt like he played a big part in the way sports like broadcasted across like. Yeah, the I, I, I think he, he was definitely an oddball disruptor. I just the thing that drives me crazy about Mark Cuban is I just hate the way he thinks about markets. Okay. Like, like he's not, he doesn't think the way I think about like markets in the sense that they should be used for strategy and decision-making and things like that. Like, like I genuinely like Mark Cuban. I just don't like the way he thinks about markets and trading. Well, Tom, you are a market maker. So of course nobody's going to, I know, I know. It's different, different <laughs> world. I know. Hey, but Tom, I, I really appreciated this time. Um, a lot sure, of great. info, um, you know, just moving forward, you know, I just, I'm going to continue to talk about the Tastyworks platform, you know, sure. like I said, just started using Doe. I'm going to talk about, you know, the Doe platform and whatnot. And I definitely sure. can't wait until uh, the small exchange, um, you know, releases because I definitely want to take that step into the futures market because, you know, I'm just tired of just being able to trade 930 to 4. So I May, know, May 18th. I to, May 18th. Let's get it. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to look out for that update. Okay, you got so it. So guys, you're here to hear first, May 18th, from the man himself, Tom Sosnoff. Tom, I really appreciate your time, man. Anytime. Thanks. Right, have a good one. All right, you too. Yesterday at the NASDAQ, it's Market Access, an electronic trading platform for fixed income securities.